Hello, everybody, and good evening. Welcome. I'm hoping that uh, you can hear me, and I'm hoping that you can see me. So welcome. My name is Anna Spooner, and I'm from the Tastings and Events team at the Wine Society. Joined this evening by my colleague Catherine behind the scenes, and of course, Sarah Knowles and W, our buyer for champagne, as well as our lovely guest, Guy, who I will allow Sarah to introduce shortly. Um, before I do introduce Sarah, a tiny bit of housekeeping. I know all of you should have got the email, which had a lovely video link for you to watch in advance, as well as some Zoom details. So I won't go into too much detail here. Uh, instead, please do select between gallery view and speaker view, top right if you're on a laptop to change the view, or alternatively swipe right to left. We do have time for questions, so if you haven't already emailed, use that Q&A button at the bottom to submit them. And if you want me to ask, let me know, otherwise the team will be in touch to ask you whether you'd like to unmute and ask your own question. And then lastly, use the chat button to let us know where you are and what you're drinking. So before I introduce Sarah, just a tiny thing to say, uh, as this evening marks a rather sentimental event as our last producer event of 2020. If this is your first event, then welcome. Where have you been? <laughs> but for many of you, you will have seen the journey that we have been on here at the Wine Society. Having never hosted any virtual or digital events, we were thrown into the world of Zoom from March. And since then, we've hosted a huge range, bringing producers from all over the world into the homes of our members. So whilst this was an event designed to celebrate Christmas and bringing in the new year, I'd also like to raise a glass to all our members uh, to reflect on the challenges, but also the successes of 2020. So a big cheers and a thank you, Sarah, for your involvement in the journey and a welcome to Guy as well. So cheers. Cheers, Anna, well said. Mm. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been, um, it's been a very weird year, but a wonderful one to finish with good champagne. And I think there are very few years like 2020 that really demand champagne as part of the necessity of life. Um, we're always looking for that thing that adds a little bit of joy and a little bit of um, frivolity in a what's been quite tricky year for many. And I think it's wonderful when we can turn to such a celebratory product. Um, product. I hope that you have all members taken advantage of our Christmas supplier supported champagne offer. Um, Bollinger have been extremely generous with their support this year. And we have um, a good saving on lots of different sizes as well of the non-vintage. So if your Christmas is slightly bigger or smaller this year, there are halves, magnums, jeroboams, and of course the normal format 75 CL bottles. Um, do stock up so that you've got enough for New Year's Eve. I know that delivery slots are getting tight, but go for it. Um, we've worked with Bollinger for many years at the Wine Society and we've always chosen to work with only a relative few numbers of Grand Marks. We try to work with the producers in Champagne that we really believe are making exceptional wines and wines that we want to stand behind and consistently drink. And Bollinger ticks everything. It always has had incredible um, heart and soul with great people, great wine and great production. And I'm excited that we'll go through some of that tonight. And I'm really glad Guy, that you've been able to join us. Thank you so much for coming. Um, as Anna said, our last producer event of the year. So um, I will hand over to you and let us start the evening without too much delay. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers, everyone. Can't see my glass, yes. Good evening. Uh, bonsoir, mesdames et messieurs. Let's do it in French. I think it would be <laughs> No, 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 I'm joking. Uh, it's really my pleasure and, and honor to be with you tonight. I'm sorry I, couldn't, I can't be physically with you all. But I think we could have shared some good moments. So, um, but um, yeah, by the way, I like the Sarah's T-shirt. It's uh, totally appropriate. Well done. Yeah, it actually gets better. Let me, I was going to save it to the clothes, but. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of sparkles. There's nothing like a classy champagne buyer. <laughs> right. Um, I guess some of you already have their, a glass of Bollinger in their hands. But before we, we go through the actual tasting, um, if you don't mind, I'd like to take you through um, 
uh, a quick presentation. I guess some of you uh, have already seen the video, a bit of video of the house, but I'm going to take you through some nitty gritty of the house, starting uh, if my uh, screen works with some background story about the cavity. Is that okay? Yeah? Right. Yeah. So as you can see, the motto of a company is be a part of a family. So I think for tonight, uh, with the wine society, it's absolutely appropriate. And also you can see that we have our hashtag, which is um, hashtag we are Bali. And I hope that tonight we are going to have more and more Bali members with us. So basically, um, in a nutshell, Banger is still one of few remaining uh, family-owned houses uh, among a few, a few brands that you know. Uh, we, uh, the company was started back in 1829. And unlike many companies that have a founding person, there were three people that started the company. So you have their name there. Um, and there is actually um, the, a German businessman his name was Joachim Bollinger. As many, many of you would know, there are a lot of uh, names of Champagne House which have a German origin. And I can name a few like Krug, Heitzig, uh, Moom, or, or other Röderer or Teitinger. So those are definitely German based because you want to position yourself back in the Napoleonic time uh, where uh, there were a lot of uh, battles and wars, and a lot of German or Prussians then were looking for jobs around. And this uh, Joachim Josef Bollinger were, was already working as a salesperson with an, uh, another Champagne house that, that has now the way, nowadays disappeared. And one day he, he met with this gentleman, you see the, 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 the painting on the bottom end of the picture, is uh, an aristocrat person named Athanas de Villermont. We used to own um, two, two estates, one in A, uh, where we actually have now our facilities, and another one in Cui, which is now a, a premier cru um, vineyard village in the Côte des Blancs. And one day, Mr. Bollinger uh, asked Mr. de Villamont what some lands and vineyards, whether he would contemplate to, to grow some grapes on his vineyard. And Mr. Um, David Armand said, I can't because I'm, I'm a, a French a civil servant. He was um, serving with the French Navy and he was not entitled as an aristocratic person to do any trading business. So he said, well, I can, I'm happy to lend you my, my vineyard. And so he did. And Mr. Bollinger uh, joined forces with Paul Renaudin because Mr. Bollinger was certainly a good salesperson, but a winemaker. So he found Mr. Renaudin was also a winemaker by trading. And the two of them started to produce and sell the first bottle of Bollinger back in 1829, 1830. And some of you might know that uh, it was six years ago, five years ago, we found some bottles hidden in our cellars. Uh, and we found the actual first bottle of Bollinger dating back 1830. I think we have 13 or 14 bottles remaining. I can tell you the wine is totally flat, but quite a, a token of history then, which we have. So this is the story of those three people who started the business. And Mr. Bollinger was certainly a seducer and a shrewd person because he eventually married Mr. de Villamont's elder daughter. And when Mr. de Villamont passed away, Mr. Bolling, Bollinger inherited the business, changed his name to French, named himself Jacques Bollinger, and that's why the company was in French, became Bollinger. So we say Bollinger, Bollinger in French with no accent, but you can say, and you do say Bollinger, and that's absolutely fine with us. Then in the company history, these are the founders. We always said there is a, someone with a vision. And indeed, Madame Bollinger was one of those famous widows that we have met uh, at some several occasions in the Champagne history. Madame Bollinger took over from her husband, she took over the business of her late husband who died in 1941. You remember 41 wasn't necessarily the, the best time in, in Europe, in continental Europe, because World War II had erupted. Mr. Bollinger died of uh, fever and Madame Bollinger was not actually really prepared to take over the business from her late husband. But uh, she was one of these uh, tough and astute women 
uh, in the business. And she took over the business in 1941 and ran the company until 71. She happily died in 77, and she's buried in AI, where we have our office in Sellers. So she contributed to the development of the company internationally in many, many markets, including the US. But as well, she was instrumental to the release and of two now famous cubes of ours, namely Banger Hardy, which I remind you stand for recently disgorged, and the uh, famous Vieille Vigne Francaise, that would translate into old French vines, which were actually a replica of uh, pre Firaxera vines that she had planted uh, uh, around the 60s. And the first vintage of it was 1969. And we still have two plots within the Banger premises. This is why some of you might happily have a chance to buy one or two bottles of Vieille Vigne Francaise, the current vintage being, being 2009. And Madame Banger was uh, the lady who actually delivered this beautiful quote that I'll let you, let you read, which was written for uh, an interview at the Daily Mail of London uh, on October 1961. And this, um, this quote to us is quite um, something important because it reflects the way we want to manage the company and the way we deal with things. If it's good for the wine, we do it. But we don't treat ourselves, ourselves too importantly, because that's a wine that first that comes first. And we like a bit of humor as well. Um, the uh, British understatement is very much something we favor. So then when we move quickly from the wine to the vine, or the vine to the wine rather, you have seen the video, so I won't play it again, just to remind you that we own about 400 acres of land, which are located, um, you, can see, you can see on the map, in the best plots of the historical district of the Champagne land. We sit in Aï, which uh, you can see is close to Epernay. Uh, we say Aï, but Epernay, that's very strange because they are hyphen on the Y. But Epernay stands for Après Aï. After A. You also have some vineyards here, Avene Valdor. Avene stands for Avant A, before A. And you have another village further the south, which is Esterne, outside of A. So everything looks close to A. Eperne after A. Avene, Avant A, before A. And Versene, towards A. Ver A. It means that A is the historical center place of, this, of the production of Champagne, even before Champagne was a sparkling wine, because this is where the kings of France used to cater for their steel red wine from Pinot Noir. That's very important. And you can see Pinot Noir, of course, is the driving force of the Bonger style. So those 178 hectares uh, comprise um, more or less 60% of our grape supply. This to us is a quite important parameter. You might be surprised hearing a Champenois telling you about vineyard ownership, but you might think that don't they produce grapes for them? vineyard? No, only 10% of the land is owned by the Grand Marc Champagne. 90% of the vineyards are owned by the growers. There are more than 10,000 growers who sometimes produce their own vineyard, their own wines, or sell their grapes onto the Grand Marcs. This is why there is a year on year of a market, the trading of grapes, and you buy grapes at a hefty price to the growers. This is the economy of Champagne. This is how the economy of Champagne is organized. So by controlling 60% of grape supply for Banger, it's quite a high, quite high percentage. And you can see the ranking. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the scale of, of ranking. You have Grand Cru, there are 17 villages with your Grand Cru, so they rate 100% in your scale. Then you have a lot of villages, 99% and 98%, down to 80%. Our Cru's at 80%. This is how we calculate the price of grape per kilo. So a kilo of grapes of 100% Grand Cru, would get the top price. If you want to buy only lower quality crews at 80%, you get 20% discount in price. So when you can see that we are above 95% of Grand Cru uh, in the crew scale, it means that definitely the quality of grapes is, is important. And you can see more or less than 70% of our own grapes go to our vintage wines, like La Grande or RD or Vieille Vigne Francais, of course. And about half of it goes into special cuvee and Banger Rosé. 
quickly, something about an important feature because the world is turning green more or less. And I'm very often uh, I'm asked a question about uh, what do we do to protect nature? So we definitely start with soil. And you can read a few things what we have done. There is no more herbicide on the roads, no more fertilizers. We use electric tractors, and we've been among the first champagne house to do so. So definitely we, we want to support the soil to allow the full expression of it. We also are very keen on saving water, and that's very important. So we have a lot of devices to recycle the water um, uh, uh, around various vineyard of ours. We have uh, areas for tractor cleaning, and we, we choose a lot of sustainable materials. That's very true. And therefore, this, that explains why Banger was awarded two uh, important certificate, certificates. One, it is the HAV certificate that is described here. First, uh, first house to be awarded was Banger in 2012. And second one was the uh, new certification of sustainable viticulture and champagne for its vineyard, which was uh, given to Banger in 2040. Then another important feature, of course, about the Banger style, the Pinot Noir, as I hinted. We see it in A once again, Pinot Noir Grand Cru village. Pinot Noir is the backbone of the style of Banger. There is always a minimum of 60% Pinot Noir in every band of ours. So you can't make a mistake. Therefore, I already answering the question about people say, would you ever produce a Blanc de Blanc? I think the answer would be no, because Blanc de Blanc has to be 100% from Chardonnay, and therefore there is no Pinot Noir. So definitely, we are definitely Pinot Noir driven, hence the fact that we have some Blanc de Noir, 100% Pinot Noir. And as you know, Pinot Noir, the same grape variety that's grown in Burgundy, will provide fruitiness and structure and aging potential. Um, this is something technical, which we may touch upon when I introduce the Banger La Grande, if we have a chance to taste it. Just to remind people that the way we do, we produce wine in Champagne by pressing grapes. Imagine you take um, a berry between your teeth, you press, the, you press the berry, you extract the juice, and you expel the, 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 the pulp and everything else. This is the pressing, so we gently pressed on our press houses. At Banger, we only use the first press because there are two presses. The first press is called cuvee. The second press, which is close, closer to the pip, um, is called thai. It's harsher, it's more acidic. We don't use the thai, the second pressing at Banger. We sell it to friendly houses that are very pleased to buy some juice from Banger. So that's important. You will read in our presentation most of the time, you only use of the cuvee, which means the first press. Fermentation, of course, you know, in for to produce champagne, you need two fermentation. One, uh, after the harvest, it is performed either in barrels or stainless steel. And the second fermentation, of course, takes place in the actual bottle by addition of yeast. We have been using barrel fermentation. You can see in my, the background that we have a lot of barrels. We have a collection of uh, more than 4,000 barrels. And we have the last cooper working in Champagne District, work with Banger. Actually, his job is not to produce barrels, but to maintain second-hand barrels because we don't use new oak, simply because new oak would be too tannic and the wine will not sustain too tannic, too tannic flavor. That's why we use second-hand oak after five or six years. Most of the bulk barrels we buy, we buy them from our friend from Burgundy. And the role of our cooper is to actually scratch the inside of the barrels we assemble them, burn a little bit, and then uh, reassemble them to, to, to develop this, uh, the wine uh, after the harvest, um, developed beautiful micro oxygenation, and that allows the wine to uh, start the aging procedure. The wine are kept, kept under, under barrels when we decide to do so uh, for about six months. And then after, comes March, April, we decide whether to declare a vintage and the blending from the barrel. If we don't declare a vintage, the one we're being fermented in the old barrel, we go back in the blend of special creation. and Quite a complicated scenario. So another important feature, which is applicable to special cuvee and Bronze Rosé, as well as the recently released 
PNVZ15, secret code for Pinot Noir Blanc Noir. The fact that we use a lot of reserve wines, which we keep in Magnum. And you know that the Magnum, as um, Sarah mentioned, is a beautiful format to keep wines. We have this saying in Champagne, you say Magnum is good enough, good enough for two people, as long as one doesn't drink, of course. But those reserve wines are kept in Magnum. We have a collection of more than 800,000 of them, and which, which keep, we keep them year by year, plot by plot, crew by crew. So when you visit our cellars, you will find AY for A, IE or VZ for version A or, and so forth. Um, so it's the um, aromatic bomb, as I wrote on there, which contribute to the complexity of the wine. So we you basically have a full blend of still wines and you add some elements of reserve wine kept in mag Magnum ranging between five to 15 years. This is why special cuvee is so special, because it's a multi-vintage blend because it includes different years. Natural cork. We keep every single bottle of vintage and the natural cork with a staple on top of it. Therefore, we need to have our riddlers, remueurs, we say in French. You know the story that they riddle a bottle by with hand. And guess, do you know how many bottles a riddler can riddle day with two hands, 50,000 bottles with two hands, right? I uh, can tell you it's quite, That's you a must have day. a very strong internal life because it spends seven and a half hours in the cellar, mm -hmm. quite humid and damp, 11 degrees Celsius all year long, taking bottles one after the other by one eighth of a turn. And uh, um, riddling a bottle to get the bottle from laying horizontally to upside down, it takes about two months. So that's quite another canvas on the So this is performed for La Grande, La Grande Rosé, Bonjour Hardy, and Baby Francais. And therefore, since it's done by hand, this gorgement, because we have a staple on top of the, of the cork, this gorgement is performed by hand as well. So it's quite, once again, a canvas and exercise. Aging, of course, is one is a key parameter for quality champagne. And basically, the finer the bubble, the bubbles, the longer the aging. But you can't you can make a mistake. If you look through the glass of champagne, if you see very thin, thin bubbles, you can be sure the wine has been properly aged. Conversely, if you see like large paille water bubbles, the wine may not be that old. Well, at Banger, we age our wine twice as much minimum as what legally required. For non-vintage, we age our wine more than three years in the actual bottle. And when it comes to vintage, it's three times on average, two and a half times. And you can see for Bonge Hardy, we have released Bonge Hardy 2004. This is our last release. It was last year. So it's been 14 years on this. All right, so in summary, Key factors, if you want to introduce Banger to a, a, someone who doesn't know much about the wine, quality of the vineyard, 60% of the grape supply. Pinot Noir, the backbone of the style of Banger, reserve wine kept in Maryland, something almost unique in Champagne. Fermentation in all barrels, almost nowadays disappeared, and time on the lips. Right? Um, then I don't want to go too much in ISO things, but you, you can trust us, okay? Uh, in terms of style, if you want to describe the style of Bonjour wine, since I said to you, every wine of ours have sustained a long aging, we are not talking about the primary aromas. Primary aromas, Sarah, you want to describe them are floral aromas. We don't talk about floral aromas. We, we talk more about fruity aromas, which are definitely secondary aromas, which are development aromas. And we like to talk about fruit in all its stages, from fresh fruit to ripe fruit, to stewed fruit, sorry, up to dry fruit like nutty character. So the ripe fruit obviously will go from the oxidation, come from the oxidation, and preserved fruit will go from will come from a cell maturation in and the oak barrel fermentation. And we like to talk about sparkling creaminess or creamy effervescence. Um, we age our wine, of course, uh, on fine leaves. 
The fact that even for special cuvee, we include those old wines kept in magnum, which have finer bubble, makes the wine very creamy, very, very soft and mellow on the palate. We want the bubbles not to be actually seen through the glass, but felt on the palate, like a velvety touch on your tongue. The bubbles actually enhance the flavor of the wine. That's what you want to do. Like exploding your mouth and giving more flavor, more the fruitiness. So, I guess it's time to start the tasting. Shall we, Sarah? Sure. Okay. I've been sipping along throughout, so you'll have to forgive yeah. me. So, how to taste champagne? I, I know you've done sorry some some bubbles. So obviously oh. we taste the wine like uh, any other wines. First of all, you look through the glass. And again, you look at the bubbles. And remember, I said, the finer, the, the, the better. So my glass of special cuvee has almost no bubbles. But I've seen then there was a little foam when I poured into my glass. So they are very tiny, 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 tiny. I think, too, Guy, it's very interesting that both of us are using essentially white wine glasses. Oh, yes. Wine glasses. We hate flutes with Bonjour. Why? It's because you want the wine to breathe in your glass. Especially when it comes to all the wines, you really want them to breathe. But it does perhaps mean that some of the bubbles go a little quicker. Possibly. It's not Possibly. A, for me, that's not a problem. I would prefer to be able to smell. No. <laughs> yeah, for me. So remember what we said before, special cuvee, uh, only first pressing, 85% on average, Grand Cru and Premier Cru, more than 400 steel wines in the plant. Uh, that's incredible. Yeah. And yeah. We have about 130 steel wines in the blend which have been selected come to the one blend. And remember, a non-vintage champagne has to be consistent year on year, irrespective of the quality of the harvest. You want to have the same style, the same flavor, guessing how it will become in three years down the track. So that's why it is so complex to produce a fine bottle of champagne. I insist. What time in the year do you make that blend? We do the blend around February, March. Yeah, because yeah. with so many different components, especially using little oak barrels as well, you have a huge number of wines to taste. How many we, do you estimate the Chef de Cave tastes? Okay, it's the chef, only not the Chef de Cave. There are eight members within our team of knowledge, and I do contribute ah. as well occasionally. I taste through the barrels. Mm -hmm. So we do flights of 25, taste, 25 barrels a day in the morning at 11 a.m. when your palate is still fresh. Mm -hmm. uh, but after 25 barrels, tasted, I'm done and finished. Um, and they do it from November to February every day. And of course, for our members, this is when the wine is still still. So still. no bubbles at all. And no I bubble. have to admit that I've tried these wines, which we call Van Clare, and the acidity level You've got to have very good dentistry to, to exactly this many young champagnes. This is very true. They are young wines, young white wine, and they are very really astringent. I don't know what you say, very acidic. Yeah. On your, they strip on your the enamel. <laughs> so, exactly, exactly, like an apple. And but they show great promise, which of course is exactly. what we're looking for at this point. Because what we're looking for is, um, of course, the, the, flavor, the flavor of the wine, the acidity level when you taste it. Therefore, the, the potential to age. If the wine is too ripe, if it's too much too aromatic, mm -hmm. it's not good. It won't age well. That's why it's, it's yeah. technical. And also, Guy, you mentioned your reserve wines before being stored in magnums. To taste those, I guess you must taste every bottle individually, and then the blend, and then yes. the components within the non-vintage um, you know, you know, the blend of, of the non-vintage and the base vintage. Correct, um, correct. How long remembering, does that take? Remembering that you need, so we always keep um, uh, one particular bottle of special cure, which is basically the, the benchmark, mm -hmm. and, which is a champagne. Mm -hmm. And we need to keep, to estimate that this particular blend, that particular year, that includes about 45% of the past harvest and 55% reserve, would mm -hmm. be eventually the same style three years down the track when you actually yeah. can taste a bottle. 
when released. So it's a, it's a, yes, interesting exercise. It's a, it's such a challenge. I always think that champagne has a hard time because we often talk about fine wines reflecting vintage, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But with non-vintage champagne, actually, the job of making a consistent style is so difficult and such. It is more. It is more difficult. I like. Mm. I like to describe, some of you might remember the Winter Olympics, where there were some ice skating competitions a long time ago. In the morning, there was the, 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 the les exercices, uh, um, comp, um, what's the word? There was compulsory exercise. The, mm -hmm. the skaters have to follow a line and they were given marks if they don't cross the line. Exercice okay. imposé, I don't know the word in English, imposed. You, yeah. Very technical. And then there was the free skating in the afternoon the next morning. So for us, Spelschkeve is this the, for, the former. It's the yeah. exact opposite. There's free skating, it's vintage. Because yes. you can play or not a declare vintage. And then you can play around with what you have and do something different every year. Yeah. Keeping, of course, the, the house style. But the non-vintage has to remain exactly the same year on year. Yeah. All right. Uh, so yes. just finish up on the technical part of special QVC here at the bottom, low dosage. Dosage is the addition of, of sugar mixed with champagne into the blend. Once you, you discard the wine, you lost a bit of wine. So you need to add up a little bit of liquid, which includes a bit of sugar. And dosage brings you the element of brut or extra brut or demi-sec or sec. So sec, which translates like dry, is actually the sweetest part of champagne. We don't produce any sweet champagne with banger. All our champagnes are brut, low dosage or extra brut, which is like Bon Girardi, the minimum dosage almost down to zero, right? Because we don't need to add sugar, to, that would hide the taste, right? Yeah. So the blend of Bon Girardi Special Cuvée every year is the same, it has to be the same, 60% Pinot Noir, 25% Chardonnay, 50% Meunier. So three grape varieties grown in Champagne with, of course, majority of Pinot Noir. So then I'll let you taste the wine now. Quite fruity on the nose, definitely. Quite complex. And you will find some fresh fruit like the apples, uh, peaches, definitely on the nose. I'm very Hello. lucky because, of course, Guy, Bollinger is a champagne that I get to taste quite frequently because you wonderfully support the Master of Wine program in the UK. We do with pleasure. And when I taste it, I always feel that I could blind taste your special cuvee because it is so perfectly consistent and of its type. It, that green apple, that very distinctive, distinctive, and yeah. richer and, aroma, and the uh, the spiciness as well, mm -hmm. which comes from the reserve wine, which I have on the on the, on the back back um, back tongue. You know, the, uh, the the taste lingers and lingers, but definitely there is um, this oaky. Hint, not, it's not definitely, open, but it's 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 spicy um, and, and 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 fruity with this ripeness of fruit that you have on. on but it's, the, as on you say, it's, it's more of a spice than a sort of vanilla component. So it is oh, yes. that kind of um, I want to say sort of baking spice, but it's um, it's it always for me also um, is very well balanced by the lees. That you can taste. So the, the brioche notes coming from the lees often feel like they um, have similar profile to the, the oak that you've used. The, the fresh brioche is, is here and it will develop when you keep your bottle on your special curry for five years, then we have this bit of toastness that we develop eventually. But you definitely have this uh, a bit of nutty character as well, together with the spice I have in my glass. And and there is a word here, vivacity, which is quite a lively wine. It's this, this again, Pinot Noir is a very lively wine. You want, you want, I won't say the elegance of Chardonnay, but it's not what we want to get. We want to get body and structure. Yeah, that's why it's a fine complement to food or great as an imperative and perfect timing for all of us at the moment. I was going to say, if you were pairing this with food, Guy, what would you pair it with? The, the special cuvee. It's quite versatile, quite versatile, because you, co you can start with it as an aperitif, of course. And I personally enjoy them with cashew nuts on the side. That's lovely. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you, can, you can pair with, with oysters. 
Uh, some might prefer a, a wine which is more, uh, bit, um, more low dosage or zero dosage. Uh, mm -hmm. But oyster, I think we, we, we do well. But you, you can have uh, all sorts of crayfish, seafood, no doubt. And we often finish up our meal. Uh, you know, French are very keen on dessert. Uh, uh, and as long as dessert is not too sweet, uh, a, a very simple dish, apple pie with a scoop of vanilla ice cream, perfect with special cubes. Really? Yes. Lovely. I'm never sure about having dry wines with, with desserts. So that's what You should. It's lovely. Or I often uh, scoop actually of vanilla ice cream, a scoop of almond ice cream, beautiful. Oh. Almond. Yep. I often go back to Bollinger or to Champagne in general when I'm onto the cheeses as well. Yes. Going, if there's been a glass before dinner, and there's still a glass left in the bottle after. Um, You're right. It's wonderful with goat's cheese or with, uh, you know, lighter, um, hard cheeses like Comte or Gouda. Exactly. But Comte, we'll talk about that later on with the Grande, <laughs> which I think is better. Well, pairing. we'll cover it at some point. <laughs> Absolutely. But a delicious non-vintage. And I think the, the skill and the ability of the winemaker when talking about non-vintage is, is outstanding. Um, yeah. So... I'm enjoying it a lot. I think a lot of our members have a bottle too. Hope so. Mm. Good. All right. So here we are. Some example. Any fish? Yeah, we don't, we don't. I personally like Japanese food. We all do. And yeah. sushi and sashimi, perfect. Yeah, raw fish, fantastic. Uh, yeah, sometimes poultry and white meat, but every champagne for Bonger goes well with poultry and and white meat. Uh, here you are, Parmesan cheese. A um, member in the chat has suggested um, that we often in the UK pair champagne with fish and chips. Oh yes, of course. It works Love it. very well, of course. Love it, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Fantastic. Good, all right. Now, uh, let's try to move to La Grande. Mm. So we love, you know, we love a little bit of, uh, of marketing words. So we said Grande, is always textured and expressive. Okay, leave it to your own understanding. Right, so I'm switching to La Grande, uh, which is 2012 vintage, which is actually our latest, latest release, uh, which has been released just prior to the uh, lockdown. Mm -hmm. Lucky were we. And then we had to stop releasing it in restaurants, unfortunately. But I can tell you that a lot of uh, people around the world have ventured into La Grande 2012 because it's been given wonderful marks by, by media, trade journalists. Yeah. And yeah. to a point that we unfortunately had to stop releasing some 12 because we want to keep a little bit for next year. So, and especially people in the UK have been extremely helpful and I wish to thank them for their support because 2012 has proven to be a very good, a very good wine and uh, with a lot of support from, from the customers. So, La Grande, but first of all, in French, uh, or in English rather, it stands for the great year. So we are very strong in marketing in Bonger. Every time we have the great year, we call it a great year. So no need to... <laughs> no need to check. <laughs> no need to check. Uh, what makes it specific? It's once again, you remember, to free skating exercise. So when we think that the, the vintage is worth it, in other words, the quality of the hard was good, we taste the wine through the barrels for about three, four months. And then one decide, one is our team of enologists uh, and ourselves, uh, the management committee, we decide to declare or not a vintage. 2012 was uh, a very awkward year because we got everything wrong on that particular year. We got some frost, we got some oidium, which is a bit of a disease. We got a poor flowering in, in June. We got an early um, summertime was pretty poor and rainy. And then we had a, a peak uh, of, um, of uh, heat wave in August, a bit of rainfall just before harvest started to allow the berry to get more juice and then the, we call the champagne miracle, the miracle champenois, not a hint, not a drop of rain during the harvest, which took place in the second part of September, and very ripe, very beautiful fruit. 
So we were guessing that eventually the harvest might be good. And when we tasted through the barrels and then tasted the Van Clair in sort of February, March, we decided to declare 2012. And so did we with 21 crew. I remind you, crew is a village. Usually in the Grand A blend, we have between 15 to 20 crews. 2012 was quite different, 21 crews. So it was more precise by using different blends, different, different villages. And you have those names here. In every of Gondani, you have a meal of, of uh, 40 or 20, no, so I would say 25% I and Verzenay, which are the mm -hmm. core of the blend because A is where we sit, where we are largest extensive vineyard ownership as well as Verzenay. Also Menil and Owari, which is um, uh, another Grand Cru, of, sorry, Cru, sorry, of, um, of um, Chardonnay. We also have a bit of Vertu and many of Roger, of course, in the Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. So, 21 crews. Once again, first pressing. The wine, of course, have all of them as still wine been fermented in oak barrels by six months. Sealed with cork on top of it, with, of course, with the staple, therefore, hand with all and disgorged. The wine, my bottle has been disgorged. You can see on the back label, Right at the bottom, in French, it said "dégorgé en," and mine is January 2020. So, okay. So January 2020, after disgorgement, we take the leaves out of the dead leaves out of the bottle. We add the dosage, which is not eight grams per liter, and we bring the bottle back into the cellar with a final cork and and the wire on top of it for three months. So this go in January, mean it's been kept until April in our cellars and brought back to our labeling line, packing line, sort of May, June. So mm -hmm. my bottle has been shipped from that period of time. So yeah. always check on back label, we have this one date, this government date on every bottle vintage bar. Right? So the blend, classic blend for Banger Lagrande. Always a majority of Pinot, in that time it's two thirds, one third, so 65% Pinot Noir, 35% Chardonnay. Some of you may ask, why no Meunier? And the answer is because there is, first of all, no Grand Cru Pinot Meunier. Mm -hmm. And secondly, Pinot Meunier helps ripen your wife a wine faster. It's good for non vintage to a degree, but when you want to keep your wine for a longer period of time, Meunier would be contradicting the balance mm -hmm. by Mesa. It would yeah, be coming yeah. too rich, too fruity. And that's not what you want to keep freshness and acidity. That's why we don't use many in our vintage. All right. So when you look at the, mm, I love the noise. So no, it's still very fresh. For me, it still drinks like a, a teenager, but definitely you can, you can look <laughs> at the color. Uh, uh, golden hue, uh, because of course this wine is only uh, is gorgeous in, in 2020, but from being bottled in 2013, so it's six and a half years of uh, of, of aging. So for for Bonge Grande, it's fairly young, but already quite drinkable. So the color is not that dark. Of course, the color of a champagne would would give up into more go more golden, uh, even uh, darker. When, when it takes some time. Very teeny, tiny bubbles, of course. But as you say, it's such a, at the moment, for an eight-year-old wine, this has such youth. Yeah. Really showing the promise of what's to come. Although of the last few great vintages, I think the 2012s are approachable Yes. Um, in their youth. But we're suggesting, I think, to members that the 2012 that we, we sold will go at least 10 to 15 years. So uh, I think it is still showing that youthfulness at the moment. It is. This is always the uh, same issue that we are meeting every, every year when we introduce a new vintage. People say, what about the drinkability? Shall mm -hmm. I enjoy it now or shall I restore it? So it's, it's give and take. You can enjoy it now on the freshness side. So yes. you can pair with some different dishes than when you age it. But as you rightly said, Sarah, any vintage, any great vintage of a great champagne house can age for 15 years onwards. Mm. Easily, easily. Yeah. 
But I guess comparing, because although um, when you were describing the 2012 vintage, I was very worried that I had made a mistake, but I believe that the 2012 is one of the exceptional vintages of Champagne and that 2008 is perhaps the last exceptional before between the two. Correct. But 2008 were a little bit more restrained when they were first released. Absolutely. So the 2012 does have a generosity and a ripeness that is perfect now, but showing its youth, um, but will age, whereas the 2008 really needed some time to show its promise. You're absolutely right. This is why uh, in the long run, we would recommend consumers that they drink their 12 first and mm. then eight. Um, yeah. Uh, so back on, on, the, on the wine, the nose is quite, quite rich, of course, with, uh, yes, indeed, I have some apricot on the nose, this, uh, this fresh, fresh fruit. Yeah. Um, a bit of hazelnut as well. A bit of smokiness as well. Again, although we do not derive too much tannin, but there is this hint of, of oak barrel fermentation. Mm. Um, honey start to appear uh, in the glass. No, I think that sort of orchard fruit flavor, the nectarine or peach is still... Um, beautiful at the moment. And as you say, I think those sort of honeyed spice hazelnuts will, will come through. Spice definitely on the palate. I definitely have spice on the palate. And again, that's mm. the strength, come from the strength of Pinot Noir. Yeah. And remember, we say it's here silky, but it's really this uh, sparkling creaminess, this creamy effervescence. That's lovely. And, mm. the, and the aftertaste lingers and lingers. And there's not a, any hint of acidity at the end. It's just goes on and goes on. That's really, a, to me, a sign of great wine. Um, this beautiful finish. So, great as an aperitif, but definitely more, even better with food. So, scallops, lobster, cured ham, any poultry, and I forgot to mention, of course, Colte cheese, which you say more goes by with RD, when the wine gets a bit older. But, any kind of cheese uh, for soft or hard, hard cheese. Yeah. We do yeah. the trick. Perfect. But in that particular, with, with the youth of the wine, this way we wrote in the first instance scallops with soil and vanilla. That's really a great dish. This is the picture. And it's, it's a beautiful dish. It's been prepared by a few chefs. Oh, fantastic. What a treat for a Tuesday. <laughs> um, by the way, I just want to turn to finish up a bit commercial. Um, some of you know um, the American magazine known the Wine Spectator, which some might call the Wine Speculator. Uh, but we have been blessed uh, last week to receive the news that the Wine Spectator, Spectator, sorry, has uh, rated this particular Grand A12 within the top 10 wines of the world this year. And it's, sec it's the second time. Uh, I think in history that a champagne has been introduced and included in the top 10 wines from an American magazine. <laughs> so we, we are extremely pleased with this outcome because it's wonderful. It's a fine recognition of the quality yeah. of our winemaking team. Absolutely. Oh, well, thank you so much for that presentation. It was a, a wonderful insight into the house and I'm very lucky to have visited. And I actually saw in the conversation going on Lots of our members seem to have visited you or been able to, which given that you're usually closed is, uh, to most visitors, is amazing that they've managed to, to get their way around with some group or tour of another. But um, we now have, I think, a little bit of time for some questions, if you don't mind. Yes, of course. I can see Anna has appeared on our screen, which means it must be the right time. It certainly is. The, the dooming moment when I appear and... Uh, Paul Gee has to finish finish his presentation. But the wonderful so sparkles as well. It's Christmas for sure. It was exactly. Um, thank you, Gee, so much for that. That was really enlightening. One member said he wishes he had had such a, a webinar when he was studying for his WSET diploma, and I think that's very true. Really insightful and entertaining at the same time. And um, so we have had plenty of questions. I'm hoping, fingers crossed, we have got one question from Scott. Scott H, we're gonna try and uh, unmute you, but if not, I will ask the question for you. So are you there, Scott? We'll give you just a moment. 
Not a problem. I will ask on your behalf. We've obviously just been discussing the 2012, but Guy, in your opinion, what is the best vintage from Bollinger in the last 30 years? Uh, that's a classic question. And obviously, I have to be French diplomat, diplomatic to answer. So, you know, <laughs> the, uh, the answer would be, if you are lucky enough to have children, which child do you prefer? <laughs> so, okay, that's a, that's a tricky one. And the other, an the other answer might be, would be the next one to come. No, it's, it, 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 the answer is vi every vintage, every time we decide to declare a vintage, here's a good wine. It's a great wine. Go on. It. So it very much depends on which time of the years you want to enjoy it. That's why I would recommend, for example, 2012, if you are lucky enough to buy, say, two cases of it, you grab one bottle now, then another bottle in six months another bottle in two years and you see how the wine evolves and you will find every time it's a new experience for tasting so there is no particular great vintage or better vintage than the other one it depends on the moment when you actually open the bottle and whom you share it with that's important i can agree to that sentiment guy uh, who you share it with is very important um, yes. But I, I think I love your idea of trying different different vintages at different times, at different stages of their life. Um, an expensive but delicious hobby. It is. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, Sally, you had a question on a, on a wine we've not actually discussed. So, Sally, I was just wondering whether uh, if our tastings team try and unmute you, whether you can ask yourself. Yes. Uh, hello, Guy. I just Rosé. wanted to know, when was the Bollinger Rosé added to the collection in 2008 ah thank you very much and that was 12 years ago and you know why a quick anecdote uh, Bollinger being a Pinot Noir driven house of course had produced a rosé wine since almost the beginning but it was declared as vintage wine it wasn't called that grand rosé it was Bollinger rosé vintage and Madame Bollinger when she was running the company, was adamant that she quoted not an easy drinking rosé was produced at Bollinger. Because at her time, uh, easy drinking rosé, namely a non-vintage rosé, was mostly enjoyed, I would say, in the red light district of Paris or Amsterdam, you know what I mean. Uh -huh. And Madame Bollinger was not this kind of lady. She wouldn't go that places <laughs> and said, until I die, not any single easy drinking rosé should be produced. And we had to wait for a number of years. She died in 77, so 30 years, until we decided to discreetly introduce Bonger Rosé. Well done. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Excellent. And of course, it's, uh, it's also a champagne that we have listed uh, usually in the summer. So although it's not necessarily the most easy drinking light rosé, it is a no. rosé it's not a summer rosé. You can enjoy it in, in the summer, but you can enjoy it, especially in the You could enjoy in, it all year. Or any time of year, because it's like, basically, Bollinger rosé, quickly, it's special cuvee with an addition mm -hmm. of 5% still red wine, Pinot Noir Grand Cru, so it gets yeah. more spicy, more body. But it's not powerful, rich. It's still special okay. cuvee with a little bit of spice. And I think that we have a tradition in the, at least our members seem to vote with their feet in buying more rosé in the summer. Uh, even when some rosés could could drink all year, but we we tend to list the Bollinger rosé during those summer months. Good. And uh, yes, I agree. It's a good food rosé in the summer, so I always think of it like that. Great for the summer, but even better when you're eating sort of fresh. It really summer. is. Um, so I'm going to merge a couple of questions, and I hope you don't mind, Guy. Um, we had Mike Thompson email earlier and ask about the optimum temperature to serve Bollinger and how long you should chill it. Um, and we also had a question in the, oh, pardon me, a question in the Q&A for what is the best, you mentioned glassware earlier, but what is the best shaped glass for champagne and in particular? Right. Okay, first question. Um, serving temperature should be eight to nine degrees Celsius. Not too cold, not ice cold, for sure, because it won't feel the aromas of the wine. Drinking temperature depends, uh, non-vintage, yeah, around eight, eight, nine, ten. 10. Uh, vintage, I personally enjoyed it around 12 degrees Celsius or cellar temperature, which is 11, 11 to 12. Slightly a bit 
not warmer, but let's say less cold. You want to leave your, your, your wine develop in the glass, therefore it will warm up. So that's important. Uh, that was serving temperature, drink temperature. What was the second question about temperature? There was another one, was it? Uh, it was about glassware. Okay, the glassware, that was, glassware, that was not something. Um, glassware, we said we, we, we don't use flutes simply because flutes do not allow the wine to breathe. And that's why you need those glasses with, which are pretty, pretty uh, large on the bottom and you can see a very narrow on the top. So you can really smell, swirl your glass around and feel the aroma of the wine before tasting it. So a, 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 a sort of white wine glass uh, would be perfect. I actually did a little talk yesterday on sparkling wines and I said um, that my favorite glass, if it's a celebration and if the wine is actually not too expensive, is a flute or a coupe or anything fun. But if your wine is very good, if you've got great Bollinger in your glass, take it seriously and put it in a nice white wine glass. You don't have to necessarily invest in the beautiful champagne glass that Guy has, which is bespoke. But I, I have a, just a classic white wine glass and that, that works for very well. Yeah, obviously for cocktail parties, if you're, if you're served a, a drink I mean, sparkling or a champagne, the fruit does the trick, but the wine will warm very quickly in the glass and you want to yeah. really appreciate. So we are talking about wines to pair with food of a meal. So that's why you use To allow the wine to sing. Perfect. Thank you very much. And um, now I'm going to again combine some questions. So Martin C had a question on RD. Viv Reynolds asked to explain what R and D stands for. And then we had another question over email asking why so few producers actually produce RD wines. So are you able, Guy, to explain a little bit to members who maybe don't know what that right. means? How and long also... do we have? <laughs> no, no, no. Oh. It's, it's, it's a very simple very simple answer to a very good question. Thank you very much. RD stands for recently disgorged, but I like to call it differently, released on demand. But actually the truth is recently disgorged, which in French stands for récemment dégorgé, which is just a terrible word. So one minute of, uh, to recap. Remind you where it comes from. You may know that uh, it is a tradition in, in, in our industry when you host some affluent guest to offer him of a meal, once again, because you know, French people, well, the food wouldn't be French, um, offer him a special bottle, because special bottle for a special person. Not necessarily an old wine from this particular person's birthday, because this person might be experienced, meaning old, and he won't necessarily have an older bottle. But the thing is, you, want, you don't want to serve always the same existing wines that you can, can buy. So it was a tradition within Bollinger, uh, and Bollinger did this particular, to um, showcase a particular wine that she would have to ask one of our staff to prepare for this particular guest you would have invited over lunch or dinner. So this wine would have been an older vintage from, this, from the house, it would have been hand riddled and disgorged, not necessarily kept for three months in a cellar, but add a bit of sugar just because it's an old vintage. You don't need to add sugar. So it would be an extra bit, two or three grams of sugar added to it. And the wine would have been showcased over a meal as a surprise wine to the guest you want to honor. And Madame Manger did so, and she had the idea to actually develop this scheme to consumers around the world. So therefore, she has got a seller master to select what they thought would be two top vintages at our time. And namely, it was 1952 and 1953. And she had them disgorged in June 67, right? Which is namely 13 and 14 years after the harvest which at her time in 67 was absolutely unheard of. It was a time when the prestige cuvées, you know, the new bottle, um, fancy bottle shape, great wines, in the likes of Dom Perignon, which was started before, but many, many champagne houses you know of, would have released their prestige cuvées then in the 60s. 
was a time where those wines were only five to six years old, and it was really showing a great wine. And but Madame Monchet, okay, I won't release a new prestige cuvee because all my wines are prestigious, but I'm going to showcase how a great vintage for Bonvé can age on the lease been recently edited. And so she did with those two, two vintages. And this is something we have been developing over years. The quantity of RD is always limited because what it is, it's actually La Grande Année, which we keep for a longer period on the lease in the actual bottle and the cork in our cellar. So therefore, we think, and we hope, that La Grande 2012 will become Bonanger Hardy 2012 in the coming years. So that's the story of Hardy, which is, and also another thing, the disgorgement date, when we took out the, the dead lead, was printed on the front label of the bottle. And Bonanger was the first house to actually release and disclose the disgorgement date on the bottle of champagne. I can tell you a bit of a secret. Next year, in sort of March, we are going to release Bonanger RD 2007. And watch for the label. <laughs> Inside scoop there. Thank you so yeah. much, Guy. So look out for that, 2007 RD, and look for the front label members. Um, lovely, thank you. So I'm conscious we're running out of time. We do have a few more um, questions. Uh, what I will say is there are some technical questions and some more generic ones, particularly the technical ones. What I'll do is uh, make sure that they do get answered and we'll send an email to everyone um, with details on those, all sorts of exciting things in there. Um, but as a final sign off question, we've had one member, Guy, ask what is going to be on your Christmas table? This year, what will you be drinking for Christmas? Oh, which champagne? <laughs> uh, I brought from my cellar because I'm 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 actually not at nor on my office to say the truth, nor at home, but I'm in my country house where I've been locked down. Um, I brought for Christmas two different wines from Bondi, actually three. <laughs> Uh, one is La Grande Année, and that would be um, 2004 vintage, mm -hmm. which I think is drinkable. Then I brought a couple of bottles of Bonger RD 2002. Very good. Which I haven't tasted yet, because 2002, we, you, you mentioned that, sorry, they are the, these are the years with 2008 or 1986, which are meant to be kept. And yes. exactly as I said, I haven't tasted O2 for quite a long time, so I want to taste and enjoy, obviously, those, this bottle of R, the O2, over Christmas. And I also brought La Côte aux Enfants, still red wine, which is the Pinot Noir Grand Cru from our own estate, which is a four hectare monopoly, which I'm going to serve as a surprise wine to my guests. Ah. <laughs> that is, uh, I suspect that they may may have an inside loop into the idea that it, at least you work with the company. I suspect so. Giving anybody uh, Pinot Noir from Champagne as a blind wine is very, uh, very mean. It is. <laughs> but, uh, but it sounds like a wonderful selection. I guess it is. Yeah, I'm jealous of the stocks you're able to, uh, to select from, I think. Uh, nothing is free of Bonjour, can I remind you? <laughs> <laughs> Thank oh, you well. so much, Guy. That was an absolute treat. Oh. No, thank you all for attending it. No, Anna, thank you so much for hosting and making everything so incredibly simple. And Catherine in the background. For yes, well done. Back there. Yeah. Um, it's such a lovely thing to have, you know, I think we were at nearly 250 members earlier in this tasting and to have so many people enjoying Bollinger this evening um, really does change how we look at Tuesdays, I think. So <laughs> congratulations, Anna. No, Great. thank you all. Thank and Thank you, so Wine Society, for putting this together. I'm Good evening to all of you. So my glass. Cheers. My Happy Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Bye -bye. Merry, Merry Christmas, Christmas Bye. everybody. Merry Christmas, all. Thanks.